begin. Let's, see. Let's go with uh, verse number 37. Acts chapter 2, verse number 37. It says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing the daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so as we begin here in verse 37, we're kind of jumping in the middle of the passage, but as the apostles are preaching and they're teaching the word of God, uh, it brings conviction on the heart of these people, and they, they say or cry out, what shall we do? They were pricked in their hearts. The Holy Spirit of God was working on them. And as the word of God is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit has opportunity to work in men's hearts. And, and we notice in verse number 38, Peter said unto them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so the idea is that when we have opportunity to bring somebody to repentance, when somebody asks us, let's not be afraid. Let's have the courage uh, to challenge them about their salvation, to challenge them about what they need to do. They need to repent of their sins. They need to turn away from who they are and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so that repentance is the idea that I understand I'm a sinner. I understand that there's nothing I can do for myself. I need Christ as my Savior. And I turn away from my old life and I begin to pursue Christ. And so we see that as he's saying that, uh, repent. And so that would be the salvation part. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And again, we're, we're baptized after we're saved. Baptism has nothing to do with our salvation. Baptism is simply an outward sign showing others that I've accepted Christ as my Savior. And I want to uh, let everyone know that. And so as they repent and they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, again, is a, uh, what an amazing promise to us. That as I'm saved, when I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit comes inside me. The Holy Spirit indwells me. The Holy Spirit lives inside me. And as we have seen in our memory verses, I'm sealed until the day of redemption. And what a blessing for the believer. And so as he comes down the area, verse number 41, notice again. They that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, it's there, you can go in some soul winning programs where they'll teach you to just kind of twist and crank somebody's arm, just talk them to death until they finally say, I give up. Okay, I'll do whatever you want. I'll pray a prayer. I'll do whatever you say. Just get off of my porch and leave me alone. I've got places to go. And, and we need to be careful with that. We need to show them that they're a sinner. We need to take them through the scriptures. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But how many times do we learn something the first time we're told? How many times is it the first time we're told something that we just accept it wholesale? A lot of times we have to stop and think on it. A lot of times it takes time. Sometimes it takes two or three times of being told. Sometimes it takes one person saying it. It takes me following up with a whole different approach to it. And then somebody comes by and, and, and connects the three dots and they say, ah, that's what he was telling me. Ah, it makes sense now what Pastor Sam said. Ah, I see clearly I need to accept Jesus Christ. So don't get frustrated with people. To share the gospel with them. To challenge them on that. Um, but allow them to make the decision. Notice it says, they that, um, verse number 41, gladly received his word were baptized. And so I think that when a person comes to that position, um, you, you might see somebody that's just been as hard-hearted and as ornery as can be with a tear in their eye. As they begin to realize, God saved my soul. And they never would have cried. They never. They might have been the meanest, wondrous person. But when God gets a hold of their heart, when they realize I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, 
It does something inside them. And so notice then we want to come and we're going to focus on 42 and below. But he says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and in prayers. And so tonight we're going to begin a study. I don't know how many weeks we'll do it on Wednesday nights. But the importance of Christian fellowship. And so we're going to focus in a little bit on fellowship. We'll set some ground uh, foundation tonight. Look at some verses that we'll kind of pull from over the next few weeks. Um, but a lot of times... I want to pray, but I'm trying to figure out where. A lot of times we hear, we might hear something from the pulpit. I heard recently a pastor says, be careful what you repeat because it may not be true. And I've heard it from the pulpit that fellowship's not what we're here for. Yes, it's not all that we're here for, but let's look at the importance tonight, how doctrine and fellowship go together. And over the next few weeks, we'll look at that it takes fellowship, it takes unity, it takes the body getting along together running completely as a human body would. When something's not right, the whole body suffers. And so when the human body's running right and everything's functioning not normal, life is good. And when the church is running right and everybody's getting along and things are going according to the scripture, life is good in the church as well. And so let's pray and then we'll, we'll look at this. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight. It's been a blessing already to be in your house. Lord, my spirit's uplifted to this just in everything we've done, Lord, and we want to give you honor and glory for that, for we know that um, we're just sinners saved by grace, Lord, and thank you for saving our souls, and that we can sit here tonight and say that. Lord, I pray that if anybody's here tonight that doesn't know that for sure, that they're saved and on their way to heaven, they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they would be challenged tonight as we study this. And Lord, for us as Christians, that we would just realize what we have in Christ and what we have in fellowship with our fellow Christians, our believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray that you show us something from Scripture tonight through your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. And so we notice there, again, uh, verse number 42, they continue steadfastly, notice, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And so that kind of goes together. There's no break in there. It says there, the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. And so fellowship among believers was important in the early church. It was important in the early days as the church is kind of forming here in Acts. And so this word fellowship literally means to share with someone else. Uh, there's the idea of a partnership. And so we're entering into that. As I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, I'm challenged about my sinful state. I accept Jesus Christ as my, my Savior. I'm really entering into a partnership with Jesus Christ. But as the church begins to form, as God is calling out this called out assembly, I'm really entering into a partnership with my fellow Christians. I'm going to be marked. I'm going to lose a lot of things. My family might turn on me. I might lose my career. I'm going to be marked as a maybe a possibility of becoming a martyr. And so I step into that realm of partnership, this sharing with someone else through the idea of fellowship. There's people today in our world, Muslims and things, that if they in certain countries would, would change, would, would accept Christ as their Savior and become a Christian, they're marked immediately. Not by enemies, but by their own family. Okay, so understand even today the, the idea is still there, the, the possibility that to enter into a partnership with Christ, to enter into fellowship with believers, could cost them away their lives. And so the, the word there, fellowship, also entails communion. Uh, the word interaction and compassion, uh, companionship. And so in communion is, is speaking. It's, it, it could be two-way communication. A lot of times communion is, is it could, can I hit the word? It's speaking, but a lot of times, can't we commune with our eyes? We commune with our, our hand motions and things like that. So I think communion is, is almost on the basic end of it. We get the interaction. That's more the two-way. We're interacting now. We're, we're going back and forth. There's two thoughts or sides to this thought. And then the companionship, companionship is the quality of that relationship. It's almost the togetherness. Hey, bud, I'm going to Lowe's. You want to ride with me? Hey, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. You want to come? And so we begin to build on this from communion, from simple uh, communion to an interaction to a companionship. And so as we grow in our relationship with one another, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, uh, the fellowship becomes sweeter. And so to have fellowship with another brother or sister in Christ is to share, to interact with one another. It's to enter into a partnership uh, of, of Christ and the work of God. And so God's word places a great emphasis on relationships with others. His word also is uh, encourage us 
to have fellowship with others. It is a means by which loving, Christ-centered relationships can be developed in the church. And so fellowship is important in the Christian life, and I believe central to the glory of God. We've never been made to be an island unto ourselves, have we? God himself said in Genesis 2, verse 18, it is not good that man be alone. God saw that Adam needed somebody. God saw that Adam needed companionship. God provided a, a wife, a lady for him, and that would be a helpmeet, that would do the things that he couldn't do, that would fulfill the needs that Adam had, that the two of them could leave, cleave, and weave their lives together. But it, it's the same thing. We can't. We like to say that. I remember when I, Anna and I were young, I was like, I can't wait to retire. I'm going to move to the mountains. I don't care if I never see anybody again. God's changed that in my life. I'm, God's completely turned that around. But if you try to do that, it won't take you very long to start going crazy. You'll start going stir crazy. You need people. You need the interaction of people. God made us that way. And I believe part of that is so that we will go out and share the gospel. As we interact with others, if we're Christians and that's on our minds, we would share Christ with more people. And so we weren't created to be an island unto ourselves. These relationships, whether with God or other people, cannot be developed without fellowship. You can try it. But it takes two-way communication, don't it, to build a relationship. It takes fellowship. It takes time together. And again, that's where I believe it goes from communion, <coughs> simple talking, to interaction, and to companionship. Sadly, though, I believe many professing believers have given in to the world's idea. I sit over here on the couch and play on my phone. The more we have something plugged into our ears, the more we've got something in front of our face, everything becomes social media. Everything becomes not a real relationship, a face-to-face -face relationship. Everything's done through electronics and we lose that contact that we need. I believe that's one reason we have so many school shootings. I believe that's one of the reasons we have such uh, just disdain for human life and, and so much, uh, we can just do whatever we want because we don't live in a reality. We don't live in a world that is real. Uh, we've kind of tuned it all out to what's electronic and what's in front of our face. And so it's sad that Christians buy into that. It's sad that we kind of pull out of things. Uh, we need to build relationships. I think of opportunities I've had just being in schools to be able to go up and say to the crossing guard, hey, how are you today? Thanks for being here. It, it really helps me out. They could care less, I think, if I never did that. But what do you think when I walk away makes them feel? And after doing that several times, when I'm there one day a week and I go say, hi, thanks, anything going on? Do you need me to do anything that could help you out? We begin to build some rapport. What happens as I build rapport? Now I have opportunity to share the gospel. And so I have several crossing guards that we talk all the time. I have a security guard at one of my schools. I'm going back to a school next year, I just found out, that I had in the past. The guy there, him and I had great relationship, great conversations about God. And I'm looking forward to getting back there on Thursdays next year to continue that. So you never know where God may give you opportunity to share Christ with somebody. And then what I thought was a break, and I may never go back there, God's given me an opportunity to ah, get back in there. Maybe that two year of time he needed to just kind of chew on what I said to him. I just read a book and the guy was saying he joined the Navy to get away and his, he, uh, everything was going wrong in his life. And his, he woke up in the hospital after a bad car wreck and his dad says, you need to join the Navy. He says, okay. So his dad takes him down to the recruiting center and gets him signed up. Somebody came to him and shared John 3, 16, for, I was sharing Brother Dan, for God so loved the world that he gave his only God. So he said, I turned my back on that guy. He said, I looked at as he walked away with just a look of hurt on his face. But he said, I thought, how could God love me? How does God love me? He says, one day I'm in the Navy and I'm going up a stair ladder in the ship. And it came back to my mind, you know what, maybe it's like a, a phone book. With all those names, nobody really knows, but somebody knows them. Maybe it's like that, and God loves me. But he said it wasn't a personal relationship. But a few years later, guess who he runs into? The same guy. And the guy says, hey, ah. they began talking. And in time, he came to accept the Lord as a Savior. We never know where God is allowing us to build rapport, build relationship, to commune with somebody. But then we have the opportunity in the church as well to build relationships. And so take advantage of it. God, I, I believe it's important. If it comes in this list of things, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. There's a reason God put those together and didn't separate. And so I think that doctrine is, is, uh, is connected 
to fellowship. Fellowship's connected to doctrine. And so the decisions in life usually will center around our desires when we get away from that. When we begin to look at us, we kind of pull ourselves away. When we look at what God has created us for and what God's desires are, we begin to invest in other people's lives. Yes, there's a chance of getting hurt. Yes, there's a chance of, of things going bad. But does God ask us to just hold back and keep it all to ourselves? No, God wants us to invest in ministry, invest in other people's lives, give them opportunity to know Him. Did He do that for me? Yes, and it cost Him everything. It cost Him His own dear Son on the cross, investing in me. And I had opportunity to say, no thanks, throw it back in His face and say, I don't want what you're wanting to give to me. And yet He took the opportunity. He took it and did it for me. And thankfully tonight, I accepted it and I'm saved. And so God's word provides no justification for us uh, to have a bad attitude or bad behavior toward fellowship. Uh, again, I think we've heard many times just said, that's not the purpose of the church. But I, I believe it is a part of the purpose of the church. And so as we begin looking at this, um, I think we'll see it over the next few weeks. Um, the application of these biblical principles, I believe, should start in the church, in the home. Uh, husbands and wives, parents and children as we interact with one another and build relationships. And so it extends then to our outward relationships with our fellow brethren in the church um, and then out to the world around us. An immature believer, I believe, will look at these and they'll begin to say, doesn't apply to me. I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, somebody that is more mature in Christ will say, I think I need that. I think that is his uh, purpose, one of God's purposes in that. So if we will obey God's commands, and, and because of genuine Christian fellowship, uh, we will glorify the Lord. It, it is a blessing. And so tonight, let's look at just a few things as we begin uh, laying this foundation. I want to see that fellowship coincides with preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Again, notice, um, kind of hit on it, Vince talking about it, but just notice they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And so doctrine tonight is the teaching. Uh, it is the principles of what we teach. Doctrine is, is the guidelines that we don't go outside of. It guides our thoughts. It's the teaching or the principles that are taught. And so it's referred to in the, Old, in the New Testament here. Uh, proper Bible teaching, proper scripture was the apostles' doctrine. As God gave the canon of scripture, again, it's simply, it's now being written by the apostle Paul. It's being written by these men of God. And so they didn't have a completed Bible, a canon of scripture like we have tonight. And so it was passed on. So when it was preached, it was the apostles' doctrine. If it went along with what they were teaching and preaching, it was considered the apostles' doctrine. Later now, it's scripture, it's Bible, it's what we have in black and white. And so the word doctrine, again, means teaching. It's the standard. In other words, we don't just meet, as the Bible says here. They met, they continued, verse 42, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and in prayers. Um, they didn't just meet for the purpose of fellowship. However, when they met around the Word of God, what did they enjoy? Fellowship. When you and I come together tonight, what do we enjoy? Fellowship. Whether it's through the singing, it, it uplifts our hearts. We enjoy singing together. As we lift our voices together, it puts us in, I, I pray, a, a mood, a, a happy mood. It puts us in a spirit of worship. Um, it pets our minds on Christ. And we fellowship together through song. We then shake hands. We have time of fellowship. We'll stand around tonight, some of us for a long time after the service, talking. We enjoy the fellowship, but what was the purpose we came for? For doctrine, to hear the Word of God taught, to hear preaching and teaching from the Word of God. But they go hand in hand. As we hear the Word of God and as we come for that, we enjoy the fellowship together. We may meet for a Bible study, or we might meet for a men's meeting. The purpose of it is, is to discuss business, or maybe we'll have a Bible study. But out of that usually comes fellowship. So we enjoy the time together. Another application, I believe, would be that because of our uh, understanding of the Bible, because of our relationship with the Word of God, we have fellowship with one another. I would never know Brother Dan outside of our relationship with the Word of God. It's the Word of God that drew us both to Victory Baptist Church. Dan, long before me, but we're here now, and Dan and I know each other and enjoy fellowship based around the Word of God. The same with all of us. I, I think maybe the Laracies and, and uh, Jose and Brittany, the Pueblos, those are family bonds. But outside of that, all of us are here because of the fellowship of the Word of God. And so we enjoy that uh, based on our relationship with the Word of God. And so the foundational content for the believer's spiritual growth and maturity is 
and was the scripture. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the scripture. And out of that came fellowship. They enjoyed their time together, uh, that interaction with one another, that communion, and that began to build into um, companionship ultimately. And so the scripture is the basis for our fellowship. It teaches us the proper way to have unity in the church and how to build proper relationships um, in, and, in and outside of the church. And so fellowship here again literally means a partnership or a sharing. And because believers become partners with Christ, we become partners with other believers in sharing the gospel. Go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And verse number 3. First John 1, verse number 3. He says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And so he begins this verse with what? Doctrine. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. We saw Christ on earth. We saw Him bodily. We saw him hang on the cross. We saw them bury him. We saw him come back later, three days later, in the body, in his flesh, and he was among us. We touched him. We beheld him. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. Doctrine, Bible, the apostles' doctrine. That ye also may what? What comes out of doctrine? Fellowship. That you may have fellowship with us. Ah, but truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Did you have an opportunity this morning to climb out of bed and say, thank you, Lord, for helping me live through another night. Thank you for every breath I took last night. Thank you that my heart's still beating. Thank you that I can serve you today. Help me, please. Man, what a blessing to be able to commune and to fellowship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we have that. Because of this partnership, uh, because of this relationship, it's a believer's duty then, I believe, to stimulate one another to righteousness and obedience. Um, we're just going to go through some scriptures. Go to Romans. Just again tonight, just kind of laying some foundation. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10. Now, ladies from Romans to 1 Peter, so we're just kind of going to go a couple pages at a time. Romans 12, verse number 10. And just think, this partnership, this relationship, this communion, this fellowship that we have with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans 12. Look at verse number 10. Be kindly affection, one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Ah, that we would love one another, that we would treat one another like a brother or sister, because in Christ we're children of God, we're sons of God. And so when we're saved as believers, we're brothers and sisters. That we would be kindly affection one to another, with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. I just think, I was going to use Joseph. If, if somebody tried to mess with one of his sisters, guess what Joseph would do? Me and my brothers would fight like cats and dogs, but mess with one of my brothers, and you're getting the fury. We ought to be the same as Christians. Hey, we might have our times when, oh, we don't mess with us. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And I prefer my brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a family. We love one another. All right, go to Romans chapter 13. Verse number 8, Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. All right, we ought to love God and we ought to love others. Uh, and so that's the command there. Look at Romans 15, 5. Romans 15, 5. Yeah, Romans 15, verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that whatsoever things were written aforetime, verse number four, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded. Why or how are we like-minded? Through doctrine, through the word of God. Out of that comes what? Fellowship, relationship. Verse number 6. All right. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians 5, verse 13. Look 
Galatians 5.13, the Bible says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Uh, how many of us get that wrong? It's about me. Me, me, me. Uh, God says, be careful. You don't use your liberty to go sideways with somebody, but love and serve one another. Ephesians 4, verse 2. Ephesians 4, verse 2. With all loneliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Because the Spirit, Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and you have the Holy Spirit, uh, because He has a purpose, He wants us to get along and to share the gospel, we ought to endeavor to keep the unity of, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Look at Ephesians 4, verse number 25. Wherefore put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Uh, we're members of the body of Christ. It takes all of us. We ought to be careful in, in lying to one another. Look at uh, chapter 5, verse 21. Ephesians 5, 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Being subject to others. Allowing ourselves to take the second place or to take the back seat, so to say. Or so to speak. Look at Colossians 3.9. I just want to see that throughout the whole New Testament, we have this idea of fellowship. It comes based around doctrine and that we fought for the purpose of unity in Christ. Colossians 3 verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds. We're a new man in Christ. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4.9. 1 Thessalonians 4.9. We looked at this when we studied through here. He says, verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And we get into Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Bible says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And then uh, go over to chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And so we say that because we're brothers and sisters in Christ, because we're partners with Christ, because there's a mission to take the gospel to the world, we ought to stimulate one another to righteousness and to good works. And so the last one I want to look at tonight, go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And look, starting in verse number 8. He says, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So verse number 10, the gift we received is the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in, He indwells us. Uh, he allows us then to have grace. And we used again our grace dispenser idea uh, that then we ought to be a good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That we can then, because the Holy Spirit is living inside us, show grace to others when we don't want to show grace. A lot of times, again, with brothers and sisters, it's hard to show grace to those that are closest to us. And so as we see, as we have unity in Christ, as we begin to build uh, relationship, communion, interaction, and companionship, that interaction is going to begin to grow, and it's going to take grace to keep those pieces moving without problems. All right, go back to Acts chapter 2 now, and we'll close here with the last talk. Acts chapter 2. So we see in verse number 42 that through the uh, doctrine and fellowship come together, through uh, meeting for doctrine, through agreeing in doctrine, fellowship comes out of that. We enjoy that relationship. And then he says, in breaking of bread and in prayers. And so I believe in, in unity and proper fellowship. With right relationships, we then can partake in the breaking of bread. I believe that this is a reference to communion. Again, that word communion as we interact with one another. Uh, it's the Lord's table, we also call it. 
um, is, is part of that. And so then he says in prayers, the prayers of individuals and, the, and corporately as the church. And let's just look at a couple verses here in Acts. Acts 1.14. Notice that as they had um, unity, as they had fellowship, they were able to pray with power. Acts 1 verse 14. He says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And so they had fellowship. They had one accord. They had that, that communion, prayer and supplication in that. Look at verse number 24 of chapter 1. It says, they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. And so in fellowship, in a desire to know God's will, in a group of people that were gathered together based on doctrine, they're now praying together, seeking God's will in this situation. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 24. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. All right. Uh, we have them in prison, basically beaten, and told not to speak in the name of Christ again. Uh, verse number 23, being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Verse 24, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And so we see again that fellowship, that love, uh, based on doctrine. And then tonight, one more, John chapter 14. John 14. Look at verse 13 and 14. Our fellowship, our partnership with Christ uh, through salvation. Verse number 13 of John 14 says, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do. Again, what a blessing to have fellowship with Jesus Christ. What a blessing to have fellowship with God the Father through salvation provided by Jesus Christ. And then it just trickles down in our relationship in the church, and then it gives us opportunity pray together, seeking God's will in our lives and in our ministry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again tonight, again for the word of God. Um, I pray that as we laid the foundation looking at what this verse tells us, uh, fellowship and doctrine, and then that leads forward to communion, at least the time of prayer, Lord, where we see the hand of God work. Uh, Lord, I believe that we, we do get along. We do have unity in this church, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful, Lord, as well, that we see answers to prayer as we spend time on our needs on Wednesday nights as we pray individually for one another. Lord, each week we have uh, many times the opportunity to thank you and to praise you for answer prayer in our lives. So, Lord, I pray that this would just be a blessing as we study this, as we see uh, how and by these things work, that you would teach us some things over the next few weeks. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing 435. I need thee every hour, and, and we do. Page number 435.